Baptist Church. I'm Jeremy Phillips, and it's an honor to welcome you here. Thank you, Debbie. Benjamin would be proud. <laughs> Very good. Um, so we have a lot going on. Uh, just take the bulletin, look through that, uh, participate in what you want to participate in, and pray for it all. Um, today, a beautiful day, but a very special day for grandparents. Um, and I know we have a whole lot of grandparent figures. If you didn't see it, um, Randy was a good example of that as he brought in the cross. Um, so um, thank you, grandparents. And I know there's a lot of those figures here in the uh, church as well. Um, please join me in the morning prayer. Oh God, you so love the world as to give your only Son, Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grant us us precious gift of faith, that we may know that the Son of God has come, and may have power to overcome the world, and gain the blessed immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I will be reading the scripture, uh, the gospel reading from Luke 15, 1 through 10. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling tri triggered the story. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one lost until you found it? When, you, when found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. When you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, Celebrate with me. I've found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one. Wouldn't she light a lamp and scour the house looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you will be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors. Celebrate with me, I found my lost coin. Count on it, that's the kind of party God's aim angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. Also, if you would join with me in the affirmation of faith, this is a statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who is created and is created.
but pay attention to the words. It's not the first verse. Watch it. Children, you can come forward. stop and help the broken people. The blind man he healed, the person that couldn't walk, he picked up those broken people. I'm glad that Jesus isn't like my sister. <laughs> he sees something beautiful in everyone. He gives everyone a chance. He knows us and he can use us no matter what. He knows the trials that we've been through that's maybe made us a little bit broken. I'm glad that Jesus would pick me up. Will y'all pray with me? Hey God, we know you made us all, and even though we aren't perfect, there's something beautiful that you see in each of us. Teach us to have eyes like Jesus, eyes that look beyond the broken parts to find something in everybody that is beautiful. Slow us down so that we can take the time to look, stop, and pick up the beautiful people and shells scattered in our path just like you do. We love you. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of elimination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Psalter this morning is from Psalm 14. Your part will be in bold. Fools say in their hearts there is no God. They are corrupt and do the wrong deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike the first. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great 
terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores their fortunes, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. My name is Joey Reed. I'm privileged to be the pastor here at Mayfield First United Methodist Church. And I want to take a moment to remind you that your United Methodist Committee on Relief is already actively pursuing opportunities to provide relief for the folks who have been impacted by the hurricane that has been in the news for the last week or so. As the ushers come forward, though, we're going to be taking up an offering that benefits the local congregation and take, helps us to take care of some of the work that we do beyond the local church. But I would like to ask you, if you have time today, to fill out a check and place it in an envelope and label it UMCOR. We'll send that on to the folks who are doing work in your name. Every dime that you donate to UMCOR goes directly to the persons who need it most. Some of the other groups that are out there, some of our friends who work in other relief organizations, have to take part of every donation to manage the overhead. But in the United Methodist Church, once a year, we take up an offering that offsets all of that overhead. So we take care of that in order that we might send 100% of every Uncore gift to the folks who need it most. So as you're taking your time out now to remember the promises that you've made to God, the promises that you would like to make to God, and the gifts that you'd like to give to God, would you remember those who are less fortunate than are we? And I also want to remind you, if you're visiting with us from another congregation and you have your tithe in your hand, Hold on to that. Take it with you. It belongs at your home church, just as we hope that the folks who miss here on any given Sunday will come back and make up that tithe when they've been gone. As the plates pass among you, remember that gifts don't always fit into the plates. There may be a gift of your time and your talents that God is asking of you. Be generous with whatever it is that God is asking you to give. Lord, we ask your blessing upon those who give and those who give with things that do not fit into plates, that don't come out of billfolds. We ask that you would transform each gift, that you would transform each giver, that all might be found in service to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
next scripture reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. We'll read this together. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb, you know, in trusting me with this ministry. The only credentials I brought to it were invective and witch hunts and arrogance. But I was treated mercifully because I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know who I was doing it against. Grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me, and all because of Jesus. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof, public sinner number one, of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows me off, evidence of his endless patience, to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. Deep honor and bright glory to the King of all time, one God, immortal, invisible, ever and always. Oh, yes. Hmm. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, we ask your blessing upon the hearing of the word, the reading of the word, the living of the word. Enlighten us that we might enlighten others for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A quick word of thanks to all of you who took the time to send cards or make phone calls, Twitter messages, messages on Facebook Messenger, all the different ways that you've reached out to me and to my family in the hour of my grandfather's passing. The time we spent together as family was difficult, as you might imagine, but we are working our way through it and trying to find ways to live so that we might honor the memory of my grandfather. Thank you again for all that you've done. You took a moment of brokenness in my life and helped me to remember that there were places that were being made whole even as we went through that particular period, which has bearing on what we do here together. Many of us have been through difficult times, difficult situations, and we have found ourselves sometimes miraculously on the other side of that situation, wondering how we got there. And we look around, and if we're paying careful attention, we might notice that there are some folks that God has placed in our path to help us get through those dark and difficult times. We might notice that they were there cheering us on, or we might look back after years have gone by and realize, oh, that's what they were doing as they helped me through that difficult moment. In church life, we spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to be a disciple. We think a lot about what it means to get up on that great glad morning and go to heaven. But we sometimes neglect to think about what it means to prepare ourselves to prepare others. To bring others into that same experience of who we are becoming and indeed who we have become as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus trying to live our lives on a daily basis in ways that will honor and glorify, glorify meaning to make known to the world around us, to honor and glorify the one in whose name we operate and act and live. Father Richard Rohr has made himself uh, known to the world, well beyond the Catholic Church in which he serves. He's done quite a bit of work trying to break into the mentality of what it means to be a Christ follower. And he's found, as many other writers have found in the last decade, actually the last couple of decades, what it means to be a Christ follower for men and women. They sometimes can be different things. Richard Rohr writes that there are two halves of life, at least for men. There are many parts of life for all the women that I know, different phases and times and, and, and eras in their, their lifespan. But for guys, it's, it's fairly straightforward. We spend the first half of our life building ourselves, acquiring things, learning how to do things, accumulating knowledge, accumulating wealth, accumulating all kinds of things, becoming in that first half of life. And then we get to a midpoint 
And because we get confused, there can sometimes be a crisis. You may know this as a midlife crisis or, hey, look, Joey's got a brand new red convertible. Midlife crises are not usually things that we talk very seriously about. We look upon them as something to joke about like I just did. But a midlife crisis, a midway point, is an opportunity for most men to look back upon their lives and think, is this where I've come to? Is there not more than this? The answer, of course, is there's a whole lot more than this. All those years that you spent in the the tool section out at Sears trying to figure out how many different tools you can buy and put into that workshop. I see some of you laughing. I'm talking to you. (laughs) What are you going to do with them? Not only are you expected to work with those tools and to build things and to give them away, I would suggest to you that you are in a unique position to teach someone else how to use those tools that you've spent the first half of your life acquiring learning how to use, learning how to build, learning how to make known the skills that you have acquired. And it's not just woodworking. It's people who work on cars. It's people who build houses. It's people who shape lives in the school system. This happens with women, too, but not to such a pronounced, divided extent. And the reason I'm telling this to you is because it has everything to do with what scriptures are saying to us today. Jesus has a heart for the broken hearted. And those of us who have become Christian, those of us who have taken up the mantle of disciple and have followed after this Jesus to learn his ways, to accumulate knowledge, to find all the things out that can be found out that we possibly can stuff into our minds, to gather habits and disciplines and to become and to grow, we get to a halfway point and we say, what else is there? I'm ready to go to heaven now because there's nothing else to do. Paul himself says, wouldn't it be better for me to be absent from the body and therefore present with the Lord? He's asking a what if though, y'all. And the rest of that passage says, no, there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. So I want you to do this for me. If you're under the age of 15 or 16, you can probably take a powder. Just don't play on your phone for too long because there's more sermon to come. What I want you to do is, if you're over the age of 15 or 16, I want you to think back through a difficult time that you have experienced. I want you to think back through maybe the most difficult time that you've experienced. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the collapse of a marriage, the difficulty of of going through, I don't know, the line at Subway. Every once in a while, that can be a very difficult thing if you're in on what I'm talking about. I want you to think about the difficulty that you experienced in that moment. Sometimes it feels like the pastor's talking right to you, doesn't it? I want you to think about the difficulty you experienced in that moment. What did you learn? How did you grow? How did Jesus move through your life? Either through the teachings of the church, the presence of the Christ through some of the people around you? What did the Holy Spirit say to you in those moments? Now, if this happened a while ago, you may be thinking, I don't remember. But I would say to you, if it happened a while ago, you may have a perspective now that you did not have then. And if this is something that is too fresh for you to think about because it's just happened to you or even now is happening to you, open your eyes and be aware of the movement of the Holy Spirit. Be aware that Jesus is going through this with you. As John Wesley sat dying, his last words were these, best of all, God is with us. No matter what we go through, God goes with us. But there are moments when in those dark times, when we're casting about looking for a way forward, we feel someone take our hand. We feel someone's comforting assurance, their hand upon our shoulder. We feel someone place their hand on our back, not to push us, or even to guide us, but to let us know that we are not alone. I say this to you, 
to say this to you. You are destined, you are invited, you are implored, you are beseeched to become that hand. For the things that you have experienced have uniquely qualified you to turn, re-enter the darkness, and find the one who stands where you stood. To find the one who is sitting at the bottom of the well into which you once fell yourself. You are uniquely qualified. Not only do you know probably how they got there, most importantly, you know exactly where they are now. And you know where the ladder is that got you out of that thing. You know where the rope is. And though you may not be sure exactly where the person who threw it down to you was standing at the time, you can figure that part out. Jesus is calling upon those who have been made whole to seek out those who are even now broken. When we go from brokenness to wholeness, there's still some scars, there's still some sore places. There's still some places where you can see where those gaps came back together. <laughs> Jacob walked with a limp, remember, after he became Israel? Because in his struggle with the Lord that night at the river Jabbok, as he was waiting on his brother to come and kill him, he had an encounter with God. And in that encounter, it wasn't just a, hey, how are you doing? It's so good to meet you. I, 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 seen what you've been up to, and I'm a big fan of your work. No, not Jacob. Jacob decided that it was going to be a wrestling match. So Jacob began wrestling with God. Let's be clear, wrestling with God. And Jacob held his own for most of the night until as dawn was breaking, the Lord reached down and touched Jacob in the small of his thigh. And it caused him to become lame. And he walked with a limp for the rest of his life, marked by his experiences with God. Our scars mark us. Our difficulties leave an impression upon us. And those impressions, whether we like it, whether we know it, whether we can acknowledge it or not, visible to the people around us sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Certainly Jacob. There are times when I go to a funeral and I see someone who is grieving their father. And I know that my wounds are readily apparent to them. I'm still mourning and grieving my father. There are times when you are in a situation that is so fresh for you it reminds you of pain that you haven't felt for decades, and yet there it is, welling up all over again. In that moment, we can choose to re-enter that darkness and dwell there, to allow it to overcome us, to take us back into the depths of that persuasive nightmare that would leave us unable, unable to think, unable to act, unable to help, Unable to respond in ways that would make a difference. There are things that terrify me. There are things that when I see them, I absolutely freeze. See, I'm not the brave one in my house. When my wife sees something that terrifies her, she doesn't freeze. She begins to climb the nearest individual so that she can get away from whatever it is. Especially our friends without shoulders, am I right? Yeah. In all seriousness, going back into those moments of terror doesn't seem like a good idea. It doesn't seem like it would be fun for any of us. But think about the one who came back for you. Think about the ones who made themselves available to you. And not just because they were trying to be stand-up citizens, but because God called them to be in that place. Might God not even now be calling you to do the same? someone who has been struggling with the very same trouble that you've defeated. 
Let me say that a different way. The very same trouble that was defeated by God, that you might be redeemed. You see, that word redeem, redemption, the only two places in our the only two places in our culture where we really use it are here in the church and at the grocery store when we're handing in a coupon. Or a coupon. It depends on what part of the world you're from. Trust me, folks, it's a coupon. So when you hand over that coupon, you're getting a value back for it, right? When God redeems you, God is fully expecting you to become useful in the lives of the people around you. It's what it means to be a part of the church. Talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Surprise. You probably did too. In some way, shape, form, or another. When you've gone from broken to whole, you are now what we call experienced. You are a veteran of that particular difficulty. And what you have been through gives you the opportunity to reach back and make a difference in the life of another. In the United Methodist Church, we are big on small groups, we're big on Sunday school classes, but in the ancient church, there was a practice known as discipling, a one-on-one -on -one process, a Timothy and Paul kind of model. And the point was that the elder person, and it's not always older in years, sometimes it's older by dint of experience. The wiser person, the more experienced person, becomes the leader, the guide, the mentor, the friend to the one who is just starting out, the protege, the one who is trying to figure out what this is all about. When you come to church, whether it's for a potluck supper or for a Wednesday night fellowship meal or for Wednesday night Bible study or Sunday school or a UMW event, whatever, look around. Look around for the people who are trying to find their way. Look around as you're walking down the streets here in Mayfield. Look around when you're traveling the highways and byways and far-flung places, maybe as far away even as Paducah. And when you see those people who are trying to find their way, bless you, and you know your way, might that not be an opportunity for you to say, I know what you're going through, I think. I felt the same way when I was going through it. Let me show you what I found. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. Let me show you what I found. Feel, felt, found. It's as simple as that. Now, you may get a response that says, you don't have any idea what I'm going through. You say, maybe not. Let's compare notes. Here's what happened to me. Do you want to talk about what's happening to you? And more often than not, you'll find that your stories have parallels. And in the places where they don't, you'll figure something out. You'll bring in a friend. You'll have another person who can come alongside you and give that wisdom through the power and agency of the Holy Spirit to recall what it is that Scripture tells us about the situation, to remember what the traditions of the church teach us, to understand that every experience of the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs us through these difficult-to-navigate problems. And let's not forget our reasoning ability. Reasoning being the product of, well, our brains are prediction machines. We are trying to predict what's going to happen next so as not to die. That's really pretty much what our brains are for. And the moment you touch that hot stove, your brain says, aha, I have learned something. I can predict that if I do that again, somebody's going to make fun of me because I've done it once and it hurt. And doing it again will only result in people making fun. That prediction machine in your brain can help you to figure out some of these problems as well. Consider well your brokenness. Even as you ponder your thanksgiving for your wholeness, your salvation. But recognize that there is a second half to life. There is a second half to discipleship. And that second half is reaching back, reaching out, and finding ways to make a difference in the lives of those who are just getting started. Even, and especially, some of our youngest disciples.
they need you to bless them as you have been blessed. And just in case you're thinking, I don't know if I could do that. The answer is you probably can't, not alone. That's why we do this together. We have to acknowledge the difficulty of what it is that we're trying to do. And yet, and yet we are called to persevere. Find your place in this march, in this narrative, in this ongoing, ever-developing, unfolding story. As you have been the hero just leaving the nest, you now can become the wise mentor, the Jedi Master, who looks upon the young Padawan and says, I got stuff to teach you. Because it's what Jesus did long before George Lucas. It's what Paul was doing long before any of these stories that we're so fond of, from the Lord of the Rings to the Marvel Universe. It doesn't matter. Find yourself in that story and recognize that you may be the wise mentor who is bringing the next generation of heroes along. Let us pray. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to look back upon our lives and see the places where we were walking only because someone was guiding us. In those moments, we can wax poetic and say, it was Jesus. And there were moments when he carried me. But we can also look at moments when the footprints were too crowded on that beach to distinguish one from another. And we realized that it was a team of people, a church, a Sunday school class, a faithful friend who brought friends along, who led us through those difficult and trying moments. Show us how we might circle back and find those shells on the beach that are broken. How we might circle back and leave footprints of a different kind and become part of someone else's journey just as someone became part of ours for a time. Take us from broken to whole and back to the places where the broken may be found. For we ask this in the name of the one who makes us whole, even Jesus Christ. We have an opportunity today for you if you have realized that your brokenness needs to come to its natural or unnatural conclusion. Come find Jesus. I would be honored to introduce you if you don't know him yet. I would be privileged to show you to some people who can help you with coming to know him better. If you've already done that, but you've realized maybe it's time for you to start the second half of your journey and become a mentor instead of being a protege, then meet me here at the same place and rededicate your life to the same purpose, but a different role. Perhaps you're a part of a different congregation, but you're seeing now that this is the place to which God is calling you, the place where God can make the most of your discipleship for the benefit of those around you. Come on, come say so. We'll put your name on the proper lines. We will do all the necessary paperwork, but most importantly, we will put you to work as quickly as we possibly can for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who have had stories that you weren't thinking about that this sermon has brought up, and now you need a place to pray about them, or you've got a story that's still unfolding, or you know someone whose story is unfolding and it's not going well, whatever. However you need to pray, come make use of this chancel rail. Give yourself over to God in these next few moments. And as we sing this last song, recognize that you don't have to do any of this in public. Today is the day for coffee with the pastor. And I'll meet you in a room just beyond this door. And we can talk in a quieter, more intimate setting so that everybody's not looking and the lights are not on you and the cameras aren't here. And all of our friends who are listening in on the radio can't hear you come down the aisle because, yes, the microphones really are that good. Today's your day. The opportunities are all here in front of you. Make the most of this opportunity as we sing our closing hymn. Before, before we start, we'd like to ask some able-bodied people when service is over to come 
help us move these bell tables back, we would really appreciate it. So with that, please stand. We'll sing something beautiful. I don't know if you can see Randy from where you're standing. If you'll turn around. Wave to everybody, Randy. Randy is taking on a protege today. And I can tell you, I may be wrong about this. Randy, correct me if I'm wrong. He did not explain to her the intricacies of what it means to walk down the aisle and place the crucifer in its holder, nor did he explain to her all of the intricacies of what it means to retrieve that and place it back where it goes. He gave her the experience of doing. And sometimes you don't have to know anything about all those intricate details. Just invite someone to the experience. Take a look at the benediction that we give to one another. These are not just words that we use to say goodbye. These are words that we use to encourage and to bless, even to provoke, to say something good to the people around us. Use these words now to speak a good word into the lives of the people around you. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Bring him back with you next time you get a chance. In the name of the Christ, amen. Bring, bring, bring.